having just reviewed the AMD R5 3600 XT and the criminally wasteful 3800 XT, which could have been sand on a beach instead of silicon, we're now returning to review the R9 3900 XT. This is the third of AMD's three new CPUs, new-ish new CPUs, where they've bumped the frequency mostly for limited core boosting workloads, and that's the response to Comet Lake, sort of. It's also an attempt to raise ASP, we think. But we're looking at the 3900 XT for overclocking performance, stock performance, and most importantly, we're testing it with the SMT disabled at 4.5 gigahertz all core just to see what happens. Why not? Before that, this video is brought to you by Thermal Grizzly's Conductonaut Liquid Metal. Conductonaut is what we've used in all of our liquid metal and D-Lit thermal tests, capable of dropping CPU thermals significantly when replacing the stock thermal interface. Lower CPU thermals don't just allow better overclocks, but also lower noise levels because the transfer efficiency is increased. The mix of gallium and indium makes for a thermal conductivity of 73 watts per meter Kelvin, outclassing traditional pastes significantly. Learn more at the link in the description below. So the three CPUs we got, the 3900 XT that we received seems to be the lowest of the silicon quality. The 3600 XT's worked really well for us. It holds higher clocks at lower voltages, 1.287 volts get or so for 4.6 gigahertz all core on the 3600 XT. And that's not even counting the LN2 clocks, which we'll get into in a live stream. So the 3900 XT, unfortunately for us, was not quite as good as the silicon we got in the other two chips but it's still better overall, and that's what you'd expect for the XT series. Now, as a reminder, the XT series isn't a replacement for the 3600, the 3800, or 3700 X, or the 3900 X. All of those CPUs, the four of them, will still exist, and they will, as far as we know, continue to be manufactured. That's what we've been told anyway. So that means that uh, even though these are all about $100 more than their predecessors, or at least than the, well, what the 3700 X launched at for the 3800 XT, even though they're $100 more, they're not straight up replacing them. So that's why it's it's kind of tough for AMD. It'd be a lot worse for them if they discontinued those because then that would just look really greedy. But in this scenario, uh, thus far, we've had an interesting set of benchmarks for the 36 and the 38. For the 3900 XT, again, the, the most interesting aspect is going to be SMT on versus off just because it's kind of a fun thing that we do with the higher end CPUs since they have enough cores without the without SMT or hyperthreading that you can get away with that. That gives you a little bit more headroom for boosting the frequency via overclocking, although not much in this instance. And then it also, uh, for AMD, reduces some of the overhead that's involved so, or resource contention at least. So we've seen uplift in the past from that action. It's not something we recommend actually doing for use. Like don't, don't spend 500 bucks on a CPU and then turn half of the threads off. It's not really why you do that, but it's interesting from a, an overclocking or competitive standpoint, if that's the type of thing you're into. We also have super tuned 3600 XT content going up soon. That will be really interesting for you. That's with uh, heavy memory tune, infinity fabric tune, stuff like that. This CPU, just like the other two XT CPUs, hit about 1900 megahertz for the infinity fabric clock. So thus far, we've had universally higher IF consistently on the XT series than we have in the older X and non-X series from our review samples in the early days. So uh, that may be the biggest change here is silicon quality overall. That said, like we said in the 3600 XT review, silicon quality for the non-XT parts has probably gone up as well just from maturity. So uh, the parts you buy for the 3900X out there right now might be similar in overclocking capabilities to this one. But uh, let's go forward with some of the testing. We were keeping this one pretty short and focused because the bulk of the stuff that we really needed to say was said in the 3600 XT review. You should definitely check that one out. We talked more about overclocking and stuff there. 3800 XT, our opinion was that it's a, a waste of silicon or sand and that if it's going to be silicon, it should have been silicon for other AMD parts in the very least. 3900 XT, Let's find out. We need to verify the frequency of the R9 3900XT in both an all-core and a single-core set of applications. This will determine whether the newly advertised boosting is meaningfully higher than the non-T original. Starting out with Cinebench for a single-core workload and using a zoomed-in chart to scale for helping illustrate the differences, we see the R9 3900XT plots at about 4700 megahertz max or one-core load. That's the maximum frequency per interval. So the average ends up in the 4700 range with the peaks at around 4740, 4750. Here's another zoomed in frequency chart, but this time for a Blender all core workload. In this one, the 3900 XT result holds about 4070 to 4080 megahertz all core once steady state is achieved. The original 3900X wasn't far behind at about 4060 to 4090 megahertz. 
Just like we discussed in our 3600 XT review, this will vary CPU to CPU, even ignoring the actual specification. For example, our 3600 XT was holding about 100 to 125 MHz higher than the officially advertised specification, which makes it one of the best pieces of silicon we've ever received as an early sample. But that was the 3600 XT. The 3900 XT unfortunately doesn't hold that same accolade. AMD tells us that the average should be 50 to 75 megahertz higher than the spec, but obviously the spec is there as a floor, and sometimes that's what you get. This sets the stage for the differences that you can expect seeing how close these two frequencies are. We'll start with the production benchmarks for this one, since gaming is less of a focus for the 3900X and XT, and frankly, we already know that all the Ryzen CPUs and up at about the same spot in gaming benchmarks. Starting with 3D animation and modeling software Blender and its Cycles tile-based renderer, which we use for our own in-house 3D modeling and animation work, like for our mouse mat, we can evaluate the impact of cores most directly. Frequency has an impact, but cores scale most immediately. Starting with the GN Monkey Head render, the 3900XT stock CPU requires 9.6 minutes to complete its render, which is actually identical to the 3900X CPU. There's no benefit to the 3900XT here, as might be expected since the frequency only runs high in limited core workload scenarios. The overclocked 3900X at 9.2 minutes, and 4.3 GHz for that one, reduces render time versus stock by 4.2%, with the 4.4 GHz 3900XT at 8.9 minutes, an improvement over the 4.3 GHz OC of the 3900X of just 3.2% for about $100. Keep in mind also that newer 3900X silicon than what we're using here, non-T silicon, likely can achieve similar clocks to our 3900XT. Unfortunately, our XT was pretty boring for overclocking capabilities, unlike our 3600XT, which we reviewed separately. Compared to other parts, the 10980XE leads the 3900XT results, but is also beaten by the cheaper 3950X. The 10900K at 5.2 GHz hit 10.1 minutes and runs behind the 3900X and XT stock CPUs. The GN logo is more intensive of a render workload, so we see some shuffling of the stack. The 3900XT at 4.4 GHz manages to outpace the 10980XE, although that's mostly irrelevant just because it was already beaten by a cheaper 3950X. The 10980XE has never really been a viable competitive part for this type of workload. That said, we do see the shuffling of the stack here as a result of the 10980XE moving around. The 3900X and 3900XT stock CPUs have both hit 11.4 minutes render time, posting no benefit from the XT. The 3900X at 4.3 GHz moved to 11.3 minutes, with the 4.4 GHz result at 10.5 minutes. The 3900XT made the most sense in these types of workloads to begin with, and so it makes the least sense out of all the XTs when considering its original base objective. That is to say, if you were buying the 3900X, it was hopefully not just for gaming, it was because you were mostly going to do stuff like this. And so that same purchasing mentality applies to the XT. You should mostly be buying it for things like this. Now, if you're sometimes doing some games, Sure, in theory, the extra frequency can help, but not really enough to justify 100 bucks. And if you're playing enough games where that's the focus, then you're buying the wrong part. Adobe Premiere Rendering is next, tested with real video projects that we've uploaded to YouTube. We'll start with a simpler RNG or ENG shoot rendered at 1080p 60. This one has the 3900X and 3900X T CPUs all clumped up together at 3.4 minutes, even with an overclock. There's no value to buying the 3900XT here. The 10900K at 5.2 GHz actually beats all of these in a technical sense and ties them when stock. That's again the problem with the 3900XT. If you're spending 500 bucks on the CPU because you want higher clocks for gaming as a primary use, you really might as well just buy the 10900K instead for gaming because it can do the rest of this stuff well enough. The only benefit is if you're doing really heavily thread bound stuff like that blender workload we showed where the extra threads really matter. But if that's the case, you don't get the boost benefit over their normal 3900X. So the 3900XT is basically pointless. For the 4K Premiere render, which is more intensive, the 3900X and XT CPUs again end up about tied. The 3900XT at 4.4 GHz moves to 8.6 minutes, a reduction of 3.4% against the previous 3900X and XT results. In this one, the 10900K at 5.2 GHz gains over its stock results by 8.2%, but it isn't able to surpass the 3900XT 
and X results and is ultimately much less power efficient given the overclocking power requirements. The 3950X leads the bulk of the 3900X and XT results by about 12% reduced render time just for some perspective of one step up. 7-zip compression and decompression are next, measured in millions of instructions per second, or MIPS. Starting with decompression, the 3900X stock CPU scored 145,000 MIPS, a significant boon over the 3800 XT results of around 100,000 MIPS. As we said in the 3800 XT review, this is a great example of why the 3800 XT is a waste of money and sand. The 3900X at $400 is the same price and significantly ahead. The 3900XT blazes a massive 0.973% ahead of the 3900X stock to stock at 146,000 MIPS to 145,000 MIPS. Just absolutely riveting and not at all a waste of time. Overclocked, the 3900X and XT scale as you'd expect. They're at about 150 to 153,000 MIPS, so not much different than before. That puts them ahead of the 10980XE, which was already embarrassed by the 3950X previously. The 10900K stock and overclocked holds below the 3900X entry at 118,000 MIPS max, allowing the 3900XT a lead of 23% over this number. For compression results, the 3900X and XT are within error and run-to-run -run variants of each other. They're the same, and if we kept running and rerunning the tests all day, they'd probably eventually skew very slightly in favor of the 3900XT. For now, with three to four test passes each, this is where they land. The 3900X and XT overclocks are the same scoring. They're within error. For this test, we've already been aware of the fact that frequency isn't that beneficial, so it makes sense that the results are functionally the same. We see the same thing with the 10900K stock versus 10900K at 5.2 GHz, which is a bigger jump than for the AMD overclocks. These are within 2% of each other for this set of results, and the 10980XE leads the 3900X and T results, but the 3950X again leads that while at a cheaper price. So the 10980XE isn't particularly relevant to this discussion. Chromium code compile is next, measured in time to complete compiling the Chromium code base with Clayton CL and Ninja. The 3900X stock results completed the compile in 64.6 minutes, with its overclock having marginal impact without any memory tuning. The 3900XT completed the render in 63 minutes, improving all of 2.5% over the 3900X stock result. This is to be expected, because even AMD's own reviewer documentation suggests scoring to be low like this. Code compile is fairly core intensive, and so it's not a limited enough workload to really maximize the boosting potential that was pushed with the XT series. The 10980XE and 10900K results flank the 3900X and XT stack, while the 10900K at 5.2 GHz allows the 3900X stock result a lead of 13%. The XT isn't worth it here either. Handbrake transcoding is up next. For this one, we get to see the riveting tale of two CPUs with different letters scoring the same number. The 3900X and XT both finish at 12.8 minutes, with the overclocks boosting to 12.4 and 12.2 minutes, offering a maximum improvement of 4.7% over the stock result for $100. The 10900K at 5.2 GHz still leads the 3900X and XT here, so if you're doing this type of workload regularly alongside gaming, it again makes more sense to get the 10900K. If you want the 3900XT for something like tile-based rendering, where it's advantaged, then get the 3900X instead and put that $100 towards better RAM or storage. The RAM in particular could actually benefit you in some applications, like maybe in code compile, where you're working with massive code bases, it could be useful there, whereas the extra $100 to a CPU won't do anything for you in this scenario. We'll stop the production test with V-Ray, which is Chaos Group's renderer. For this one, the 3900X stock scores 20,000 points, ranked just behind the stock XT. V-Ray somewhat recently moved from a time-based system to a points-based system just so that they could change it to be higher is better, which isn't really the way we'd do it, but it's the same ultimate idea. So uh, the XT offers an uplift of 0.85% over the stock result. Overclocking maxes out at a 6% gain over the stock XT. And that's about it for V-Ray's results. We'll move into power testing next. We're measuring out the EPS 12 volt cables for this one with Blender being used after the five minute mark so that Intel Tau has expired. The 3900XT and 3900X are at about the same power here, which makes sense since it's the same part. We won't pop it on the screen, but we also have one core workload numbers from Cinebench R20 logged, and that has the 3900X 
and XT, both at 42 to 43 watts for a one core load. So that hasn't changed in spite of the frequency uplift, which is a point in favor of the XT. The 3900X is less efficient than the 3950X, where ours runs at 140 watts. And there's benefit to silicon quality here, where lower voltages can be used to sustain the higher end parts than with something like the 3900X versus the 3950. So that's why it's advantaged there. But we talked about that in the 3950X review. Cinebench R20 for all core only really changes in power numbers for the Intel parts that are now within turbo duration time limits. The 10900K is a good example of this at 200 watts instead of 120 to 130 after turbo time expiry in the blender workload. But otherwise, the AMD stuff's more or less the same. Now we're getting into game tests. The first game benchmark coming up in a moment will best explain why the 3900XT and the 3900X end up where they do. The SMT off test will be the most interesting, but we want to really heavily emphasize that we're not recommending buying a Ryzen 3900X or a Ryzen CPU in general and then disabling SMT. That's literally half of the reason that you buy a CPU whose strength is its core count. It's more of an academic exercise for fun and potentially useful for competitive overclocking or benchmarking. The 3900X original results were at 121 FPS average and the 3900XT is within error of that and functionally identical. There's no benefit from the extra $100 for a CPU which supposedly is trying to improve in its gaming performance. In fact, you might as well buy a 3600 or a 3300X if this is your goal, the latter of which benefits from a single CCX configuration. The 3900XT 4.4 GHz clock puts it one FPS average above the previous 4.3 GHz overclock, again, failing to provide value. And we'll also note that this one FPS range is kind of about what AMD was showing in some of its supplemental review materials. So this is where they expect it to be too. All the Ryzen CPUs tend to max out at around the same spot, and it becomes a really tricky balance with cores and threads more so than with Intel. The 3700X and 3800X are the right combination of threads and frequency for this game, whereas the 3900X tips into territory where it now has suboptimal distribution of work across those extra threads, which then limits its only advantage of boosting higher. So it ends up lower than some of the other CPUs from AMD. Since the threads are still in use, the CPU can't benefit from higher two or four core boosting values. The 3900XT with SMT off at 4.5 gigahertz does comparatively well, breaking the 130 FPS wall for AMD and moving to 136 FPS average, but it's still just below the $300 10600K. Overall, the top positioning of AMD's SMT off result is a gain uh, over the 3900XT at 4.4 gigahertz of 10% which mostly comes down to disabling SMT, proving our point earlier about balancing threads for certain types of workloads. F1 2019 is next, where we should theoretically see some more scaling from the single core and dual core boosting frequencies. And finally, for once, we do. This is it. This is the biggest it's gonna get, so enjoy it. The 3900XT stock holds a four to five FPS average gain over the 3900X stock, which is one of the most exciting gains we've seen thus far but it looks a lot bigger than it should since it's so distant in the listing. The actual range is 1.9% over the 3900X stock. Disabling SMT, overclocking at 4.3, 4.4, 4.5, none of it really matters, and it's all within test variants here. They're functionally the same. Even the 2017 7700K at 5.1 gigahertz has a lead here, and the 10600K maintains positioning as one of the best gaming-only CPUs right now. This is the instance where limited thread boosting should actually matter, but it's just not making much of a difference overall. 2% is the maximum change we're seeing, and that's still in line with AMD's 2 to 4% expectation. Hitman 2 is next, where we typically do see actual scaling with the AMD CPUs, sort of, at least, sometimes. The 3900X stock ran at about 124 FPS average with the 4.4 GHz OC and 4.3 GHz OC as well, both within error of each other. The 3900XT offered no benefit over the 3900X stock to stock, and disabling SMT and going to 4.5 got us a gain of 4.8% max over the other 3900X CPU listings. That allows it to surpass the $300 10600K CPU just barely when it's stock. So more of the same in terms of the hierarchy. AMD's claim to gaming improvement is really limited to specific games that are becoming less common, which AMD itself has been saying repeatedly over the last three years. So it's kind of a confusing launch and feels almost like AMD is trying to go backwards to target something that they really shouldn't be targeting. Shadow of the Tomb Raider has the 3900X stock at 147 FPS average, about 3.1% ahead of the 3600XT stock CPU, 
with the 3900X equaling the 7700K at 5.1 GHz. The 3900XT stock CPU doesn't change much, now at 148 FPS average instead of 147.2. The 3900XT at 4.4 GHz and 3900X at 4.3 are about the same and they're within test variance once again, with the SMT off result at 153 FPS average. There's not much to talk about here. The 10600K still leads all of these CPUs for gaming, and if you're more gaming oriented but really want to spend $500 on a CPU that can still sometimes do heavier workloads, the 10900K leads by a massive 20% margin OC versus OC with SMT on, in this game at least. Obviously, the 3900X is still better in a lot of the production applications, but then you should just use the 3900X, not the T. This only gets worse as you get into 1440p or higher GPU loading scenarios, since the extra $100 spent on the letter T will become disproportionately useless. It's the same argument people use against Intel, except now it can be leveraged against AMD's XT series of CPUs. As you load the GPU, that extra frequency becomes less and less relevant, and for $100, it's hard to forgive that. Red Dead 2 with medium settings doesn't have the 3900X in it yet, since we haven't fully rerun everything, but it's still interesting data with what we have. That's because the 3900XT with SMT off is actually worse here. Not much, but still worse, at 124.8 FPS average instead of the 128 FPS average baseline. The stock and 4.4 GHz overclocked results are functionally equal to each other, so we'd need to do more tuning, like in our 3600XT tuning piece coming up, to really see a benefit. That'll mostly be in memory, though, and you can do that on both platforms. Performance is overall about equal to the 3800XT and leading the 3600XT stock result of 121 FPS average by 6.5%. The 10600K leads by a wide margin for gaming only, and also maintains superior frame time consistency in this title. GTA 5 should probably show an actual change, because it did in our 3600XT review. The 3900XT stock CPU ended up about the same as the 3900X. It's error, again, or within the test variance. The 3900X and XT with overclock scaled at least in the expected order, but not meaningfully so. Disabling SMT and going to 4.5 gets us to 116 FPS average, a gain of about 2.6%. Intel still predictably leads these charts, but if you are buying AMD to mostly use for production and sometimes to game with, it's still not worth buying the XT over one of the many other AMD CPUs that doesn't have the letter T in the name. So concluding then, if you're spending $400 on a CPU and you're choosing AMD, it obviously shouldn't be the 3800XT, it should be the 3900X. That's more or less its official price at this point. It's fallen $100 from launch. And that's a good price. The 3900XT comes in at the original 3900X pricing, but is about the same in performance almost universally across the board in nearly every test we performed, except for maybe silicon quality. And even there, if you're buying modern 3900Xs versus these, it's all lottery anyway. So unless you're in a competitive overclocker, you're into competitive benchmarking, stuff like that, really small audience at this point, it's not really worth buying a 3900XT. It just isn't. You should get a 3900X instead. If you're into the competitive scene, then, well, go ahead and buy XT just to raise your chances of getting a guaranteed good chip. But the, actually, even then, it's not really guaranteed because you could end up with one like ours that isn't really much better than the originals. But anyway, if you're spending $500 on a CPU just because you want higher clocks for gaming, this is where this all gets weird. AMD knows that it hasn't been particularly strong in gaming as compared to its workstation performance. It's fine. It does okay. And at least in the, the 3000 series especially. And that's an okay place to be, but AMD's not the best and it knows that. Intel and the, uh, the 10600K especially, but the 10900K at this price point, those are the best CPUs for gaming still. AMD's trying to encroach on that territory a little bit, but in so doing, it's worsening its value, which is going against AMD's core values recently. And uh, it may be in more of a position to do that because it's gotten some more market share. It's held in higher regard, so they can start increasing their average selling price again. But also, AMD's kind of almost going backwards in a way because you have to be playing games that are such limited thread count workloads that... Even some of the old games that we test, like GTA 5 that we keep around, they're not showing that big of a difference. So it's just the, the games are still loading enough threads where in most instances we're really not seeing much of a change. And AMD itself, again, advertises a maximum about 4% change. So, and we barely even saw that, like ever, in any of these XT chips. We saw like 3.7% in one of the instances. So 
it's just, it's not really particularly worth it. If you're spending 500 bucks because you want higher clocks in gaming, you should buy a 10900K instead. The only instance that's not really true is if you need really high performance in things like tile-based renderers and compression, decompression, things like that, then the, uh, the 10900K starts to lose value, the 3900X at $100 cheaper gains value, and then you spend the $100 difference on better memory or a better video card, which will get you pretty far in a lot of gaming scenarios. So that's how we dice it up. And uh, other than that, the 3700X still makes a lot of sense. It's $262 at time of filming this in the US, anyway, on Amazon. Uh, so hopefully that price holds. But that's a good step down. That actually makes a lot more sense now than it did at launch. 3600's been in the 160s, 170s lately. Also extremely competitive pricing, mostly with AMD itself. And then the 10600K is still our choice for the best sort of, not budget, but just the best all around, like uh, best, most well-rounded gaming part, considering price and gaming performance, especially once it's tuned. It's really fun to, to overclock and tune. So where does that leave the 3900 XT? Well, not really anywhere. The 3900X makes a lot more sense. And that $100 difference, again, goes a lot better towards even a better cooling solution, which will help you get to the clocks of one of these. So uh, that more or less caps this review. SMT on versus off was kind of interesting, but otherwise check back for the super tuned 3600 XT content where we really push the memory hard in that one. And uh, I guess also we'll just kind of throw in the note here. This is how it ships. So we've got this criminally wasteful amount of foam in a box to ship the CPU to go with the wasteful use of sand. So that's that one. Uh, thanks for watching. Subscribe for more. If you want to support this type of content, you can go to store.gamersnexus.net and grab something. AMD is typically one of the most vindictive companies when we review things, and hopefully that's starting to change. But normally when we do something like this, they take us off the review list and we have to get stuff from someone else. But maybe AMD is starting to learn that doing that is worse overall for it. Uh, but we'll see. Either way, we'll have the next ones to review, whether it's from them or not. You can go to patreon.com slash gamersnexus to help us out as well. And subscribe for more. Check back for the XT stuff, for tuning. We'll see you all next time.